Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm John Cowan, president of Third Way, and I am thrilled you could join us today. So I have two teenage daughters at home, so I know a lot about shopping. But no one, not even my girls, shops like the federal government. The federal government is the largest customer in the world. It spends $600 billion a year on everything from light bulbs to airport runways. Now, $600 billion is a giant pie. Historically, though, small businesses have only gotten a sliver. And for minority-owned and women-owned businesses, it is barely enough to fit on a fork. So what stands in their way? Confusing requirements, preferences for established businesses, high application costs, and much more. Now, you can't blame everything on the government, even though some may try, but this is a key reason that why, why only 2% of businesses with employees are black-owned and only 6.5% are Hispanic-owned. Those numbers are awful, embarrassing, and tragic, and we are setting out to change them. Thanks to the bipartisan infrastructure bill, the Biden administration has made an historic investment in America. The task now is ensuring that investment is effectively and equitably implemented. The Department of Transportation is the center of those efforts, and that is why I am so grateful Secretary Pete Buttigieg is here today. You're all familiar with the highlights of the Secretary's bio. Navy Reserve, Rhodes Scholar, two-term mayor, and now the 19th Secretary of Transportation. But did you know that he was the senior class president? And that his mom said that she began to be suspicious he might enter politics when he was in college. Aren't we all happy he did? The Secretary will be joined on stage by Mark Morial, another former two-term mayor. Mark is the only man I know who can write a book about gumbo and tie it to creating lasting real political change. Mark has been brilliantly leading the National Urban League for the last two decades, and he's been our thought partner in the creation of the Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity, a joint effort between the Urban League and Third Way. Together, we are setting out to close the entrepreneurial equity gap in this country. Following Mark and the Secretary, my colleague and the Director of the Alliance, Amani Augustus will moderate a discussion with leaders from DOT and the Urban League. They're going to focus on tangible ways minority-owned businesses can more fully participate in federal investments. It will be a great afternoon. Before I turn to Mark and the Secretary, I want to thank AEE's Industry Council members, Amazon and Wells Fargo. Their support and deep and abiding commitment to these issues makes events like this possible. So thank you. Now, please join me in welcoming Secretary Pete Buttigieg and Mark Morial. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And I understand this is the District Architecture Center. I ask, what goes on here? Uh, still haven't found out, but I know it's something important and creative. I'm honored. Uh, to be with Secretary Buttigieg today. Let's give John Cowan another round of applause. I want to thank him and the Third Way team for the relationship that we are building and the initiative we're building. I want to just begin because I think it's important uh, for uh, all to know uh, the Urban League's uh, sort of genesis uh, around the infrastructure bill. We began over 10 years ago by developing a plan known as the Main Street Marshall Plan. And it was inspired by the fact that in the early period after the Great Recession, uh, the notion was that all we had to do was fix Wall Street and the nation would be healed. Uh, we said, no, you must fix Main Street. And that inspired a comprehensive plan, which I'm proud to say uh, became both an inspiration and components of it were incorporated into the bill that the president proposed and that the Congress passed. But secondly, I just wanted to quickly uh, let you all know that the infrastructure bill and its equitable implementation 
is one of the National Urban League's highest priorities. And we have promulgated a number of things under this umbrella. We have 13 entrepreneurship centers that serve eight to 10,000 businesses a year. We have a number of partnerships, including Build Up Local, which is designed to create a single portal where there's information about uh, the infrastructure bill. Uh, we have a newly relaunched community development financial institution called the Urban Empowerment Fund, which is there to give loans to businesses uh, who find uh, capital access uh, lacking. We do a conference each year, and it's focused this year in Houston called Small Business Matters, will be uh, to educate and inform people about how they can take advantage of this. We just announced a new relationship with the Department of Labor and the National Association of Building Trade Unions. Pioneering relationship, uh, the last uh, relationship that Secretary Walsh signed before he left to go become part of the National Hockey League Players Association, in fact, to lead that organization. And the purpose of it is to recruit African Americans and other people of color into building trade union apprenticeship programs. Uh, and we also uh, certainly uh, have a role and a participation as one of the main partners in the Small Business Administration's Navigator Program, which is also designed to support small businesses. And last but not least, we have the Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity, uh, which we celebrate today, which we showcase today, which is again designed to address uh, the long-standing, if you will, barriers uh, and challenges that the nation's businesses owned by people of color face. So we are doing a lot, and our approach in this space is partnerships. Mr. Secretary, to partner with government, non-government, business, uh, et cetera, in order to do this. I want to begin this way. There's a, you put a lot of energy into this bill. But there's a misunderstanding about how this bill works and what it funds. It's, some people think it's a giant master plan by the federal government where the federal government is playing Santa Claus and handing out projects, uh, when in fact there's a dynamic role for both the federal, state, and local levels. Some people think it's a highway paving program with a few other components of it, when in fact it is a broad investment in uh, both uh, traditional infrastructure and what we might call 21st century infrastructure. Could you sort of shed light? Because I think yeah. people need to understand what this bill really is. That's a great question. First of all, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to, to uh, President Mark Morial and the Urban League for the work that you do and for gathering us today, to John uh, Cowan and Third Way, everybody who's part of this because what we're discussing is one of the most important dimensions of what's happening right now in domestic policy, which is the opportunity for this infrastructure work, not just to renew our infrastructure, but to create generational wealth. I believe the proportions of this bill, we're talking about $1.2 trillion, about half of which is transportation. The proportions of the work are so great that if we get this right, economic historians will look back at the 2020s and say, one of the reasons why the 2020s saw a major reduction in those wealth gaps is that there was intentionality about access and opportunity with regard to how those dollars were applied. But to get that right means attention to the question you're raising. We don't design or make or think up any infrastructure projects in the Department of Transportation. Uh, or as I often put it, the, the, the ideas and the projects don't emanate from Washington, but more of the funding should, and now more of the funding does. So far, 20,000 projects have been identified or announced as getting support from the funds in the infrastructure law. Of that 20,000, probably about one in 10 are projects that we decided on in competitive processes where I would sign off on saying, yes, this one made the cut and the rest of these didn't. And even those, again, we didn't invent. The, the, the applications came to us and we did our best uh, to, to uh, identify the winners in that competitive process based on the criteria that Congress gave us. 
But for every one project that is identified by a team at the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. there's 10 that are decided on through the formula dollars that are going out to communities. And even the ones that are in the competitive process, it's local and state players, tribal uh, governments, transit authorities, that are developing the projects to apply to us for. Now, the reason I want to make sure this audience is conscious of that is that it can be empowering to learn that many of the most important decisions are being made closer to home. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, we're doing our part federally. So uh, the president set an ambitious goal for how much procurement federally was going to go through SDBs. Um, we set a higher goal at DOT, and we beat that higher goal. I think we're at 22, I'm looking at my colleagues, 22% plus, right, mm -hmm. this year, and aiming to take it even further. 22% of DBEs. Um, uh, to S yeah, the small disadvantaged businesses. But so much more of the funding is moving through those other pipes, so to speak. We send the funding to a transit agency mm -hmm. to, uh, to expand one of their routes. Mm -hmm. We say yes to an airport authority that wants to redo their security checkpoint. We have a level of formula dollars that will go to the Oklahoma Department of Transportation, and they will spend that as they see fit. And so two sets of things need to happen. One we're doing, which is to do everything we can with our formal authorities and unofficially encouraging communities, states, transit agencies, airport authorities to open the gates so that small businesses, minority-owned businesses, uh, can participate in that work. The other thing that has to happen is those decisions that are closer to home need to reflect that too. Because often actually a lot will depend on the city council mm -hmm. or the county that is in control of the airport or the local elected representatives on the transit agency board. Uh, and those are rooms that people can get into. Uh, you know, to test, I was just on Capitol Hill, in order to testify in Congress, you actually have to be invited. As you and I both know as former mayors, to uh, have your say in a city council meeting, in most communities, you show up and, and everybody loudly. has to hear what you have to say. <laughs> and so I just want to make sure there's awareness of that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that a lot of the work is here in Washington, but a lot of it. So what you're saying is nine out of ten decisions Roughly. on which projects get funded are, are going to be made by state and local governments, exactly. right? State agencies transit authorities, water authorities, regional planning boards, and the like. Given that, how do you ensure that the aim of the president that we all embrace and support for equity mm -hmm. and racial inclusion, that those goals are met, mm -hmm. uh, that there's no game playing, no smoke and mirrors, uh, no uh, foot shuffling, and sob stories, how do you ensure that? Well, let's begin with the question of access. Mm -hmm. Even knowing where the opportunities are is something that large incumbents have had a leg up on. Yeah. There's a bit of a word of mouth process yeah. that we need to break through to make sure that uh, people, especially people who are interested in growing their business or making sure their business can get involved in this work, know when the opportunities are coming, know before the opportunities are coming that they're on their way so they can gear up and get ready. Mm -hmm. And we are working to make sure that there is a level of transparency around that. Not just, again, not just here in Washington, putting more information online, giving more of a sense of the pipeline, but we're getting out in the field. Uh, you'll hear more later from my colleague, uh, Tyra Reedus is the acting director of uh, OSDEBU, our uh, Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. OSDEBU is staging events around the country, like Connections Marketplace, which is where the businesses can get to know uh, uh, the other people they should be getting to know to get plugged in. Uh, we have a network of SBTRC, Small Business Transportation Resource Centers, around the country, geographically placed mm -hmm. in the different regions where a lot of this work will get done. We are teaming up. You, you mentioned that this is a, a presidential and an administration-wide uh, commitment. Mm -hmm. We are teaming up with the Small Business Administration that has a lot of experience and a lot of relationships here. Uh, and we've worked on things like how do we make sure our DBE processes and their 8A system talk to each other a little better. Um, we are working with the newly reinvigorated Minority Business Development mm -hmm. Administration mm -hmm. under Commerce. Mm -hmm and their leadership. So you're going to see Commerce, you're going to see SBA, you're going to see us. Uh, you mentioned the partnership with Department of Labor and how important that is. All teaming up, not just here in Washington, but out in the field, 
to make sure that there is more access. Then there's the actual programming itself. And we, we know that the DVE programs of our department are not necessarily as user-friendly as they could be, to put it gently. Mm -hmm. um, now, they, some of that is for a very good reason, which is the importance of the program integrity, but we've got to find ways to make it easier to navigate and more straightforward and more interoperable if you're also involved in a state program. Mm -hmm. We're in the middle right now of revising the DVE rules, a process that, again, our, our OSDEBU office is involved in and led by our Departmental Office of Civil Rights. Uh, to make sure that, that it's, it's simpler, more straightforward, uh, but also maintaining that integrity. So uh, I guess my point is that, that part of it's about the access to the information, but part of it's about the program rules themselves. We're working on both. So how much, so one barrier that uh, we hear uh, are the legacy gross receipts mm -hmm. and net uh, worth caps, which... Uh, I remember I was a young lawyer in the late 1980s representing a group of 8A contractors when those rules were proposed by the Reagan-Bush administration, and it was really an attack on the success uh, of uh, the fully loved decision and the Surface Transportation Act goals. Uh, what relief, what avenue What's uh, your thought about those types of barriers? What can we do? Yeah, we've heard from a lot of business owners yeah. who describe this experience of being, as, as they put it, too big to be small and too small to be big. That's right. The whole idea is to create successful businesses and successful entrepreneurs whose mm -hmm. wealth and ability to create wealth grows with their businesses. And so that personal net worth cap can become a constraint on that. Yes. Uh, and so uh, our revision to the rule contemplates a couple of things. One is lifting that ceiling. Another has to do with what counts toward it, a retirement plan. Do we want to punish somebody for, for saving for retirement by counting equity. that against the, the, the when the very goal of this is, is, is the chance to have equitable creation of generational wealth. Mm -hmm. So we're very mindful of the, those barriers, and it's one of the things that's being addressed in our refresh of the rules. So I want to certainly continue to encourage that. So... Right now, according to the, the information we have across the federal government, uh, participation in federal procurement is less than two for black, Latino, Asian, and indigenous businesses. Uh, to educate people on this infrastructure bill, what's the goal you work towards? Uh, and if you looked at, let's say, the first round, how are you doing? on achieving that goal because I think people need to understand what's the goal that the law right. and the program contemplates and then how are you doing so far? Right. So the, there are overlapping goals created by the fact that we're, we've got different programs in different jurisdictions. As I mentioned, uh, we set a 20% goal for our direct procurement uh, it, with, with SDBs. Uh, but when you look more broadly, much will depend on the states and their own goals because they have their own legal framework state by state. In order to know how we're doing, first thing we're trying to do is just get better visibility. Uh, staff members have heard me grumble about the fact that in our building, I can see a map on the wall that will show me the position and location of every aircraft in the national airspace, but I can't find one that will show me where the different dollars are going, even federal dollars, once they're out of our hands and with the states. We don't have the kind of data gathering that we need in order to tell us how much of this funding is getting to small businesses, black-owned businesses, uh, any of the various disadvantaged or, or I would say, um, underestimated businesses mm -hmm. that are out there. Uh, and so we're working to get more of the data without creating yet another reporting burden that makes it harder for the very groups we're trying to help. And that's a tricky science to get right, mm -hmm. but we have great people working on it right now. Mm -hmm. And as we get that, it'll start to tell us. It's early, right? I mean, we're just announcing the the projects b before the money can even start to move. But once it does, it'll move quickly. And so we want to make sure by the time that happens, we have the, the tools in hand to be able to answer questions like the one you're, you're mm -hmm. posing right now. So right now, it's not clear? Is that would be the I would best say for the, it, the honest answer would be that we don't have that granular data for the formula dollars that go out, mm -hmm. except in a handful of states that do an unusually good job at mm -hmm. keeping track for their own purposes. Uh, would you name any states that no. might be, uh, I know it's tricky to do yeah. this, but we need to know who we ought to be 
uh, throwing a bouquet at and then uh, who I need yeah. to wake up in the morning and throw a little brick at. <laughs> Debbie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punt that one to my colleagues who are closer to it um, because they yes, live sir. and breathe okay. this. All um, right. but, uh, but yeah, love to know. Lesson I, because I think people want to know. Yeah. Uh, and this, this runs the gamut in the work we do. Mm -hmm. How's state A doing? How's state B doing? Is my state a performer? Because sometimes the information at the uh, state level is even more difficult right. than it is at the federal level. Yes, but also I would say there's some state and local authorities that are leading the way. Uh, take, for example, the Equity and Infrastructure Project, uh, led, uh, uh, led partly by Phil Washington, who is the uh, Denver uh, airport director, who has brought together a coalition of first movers. Uh, transit agencies, local governments, uh, airport authorities, who are stepping up saying, we want to be among the leaders in this mm. and build richer data than the law says we have to mm -hmm. and do a better job than the targets uh, say we had to, to raise the ceiling so that we can begin to raise the floor. So, you know, some of the work that we're doing, you know, I mentioned this initiative, Build Up Local, our entrepreneurship centers, we want to be hooked in on providing the best freshest, mm. most up-to-date data and information mm -hmm. so people are clear about how's the project going, but also how they can participate. Mm -hmm. So we want to do that. Let me ask uh, two other questions uh, somewhat uh, related. Talk about the, even though this is not in DOT, the water side. Mm. Because the water side of the infrastructure bill has generated tremendous interest because of what we saw in Flint. Right. Because of what we saw in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, what uh, what can you share about the water investments? Well, even though I'm I'm less knowledgeable about this than my colleague Michael Regan lead, mm. leading the EPA, which is doing the bulk of the work to deploy those dollars mm. to eliminate lead service lines. What I can tell you is that it's first of all um, imperative because <laughs> the even if you want to put it in crass economic terms, there's no way to fully express the return on investment when the investment is in a child not being lead poisoned. There is no safe, there's no safe level of lead. And exposure to lead can last a lifetime. Uh, this can be measured even in things like the likelihood of encounters with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, what can't be measured, of course, is, is the moral weight of making sure that children are not expo exposed to lead in the first place. And beyond lead, there are communities today that do not have adequate wastewater. The most basic things that we would think every part of the United States enjoys are not there. Uh, and uh, Administrator Regan and his colleagues are doing phenomenal work to take these dollars and get them out there. But it's a good example of something where, again, a lot of the work will ultimately come to local bodies, a local water municipality. Water um, but again, as, as we both know as former mayors, it's, it's the most important and literally the most basic service in as much as you need water to live that government can provide. And we, I think we, we also have to recognize that the, the idea of you know, potable water, running water in dwelling places mm -hmm. was really an innovation of the early 20th century. Mm -hmm. Before that, people went outside. Where I come, they used to call it the outhouse. And so many of these water systems are old you know, 100 years old or slightly less than 100 years yep. old. And so this investment couldn't be more timely. And I think uh, I'm, I'm, ex I'm excited but also appreciative of the fact that this water investment, because for urban communities, for lots of inner city black communities, uh, for even many rural communities, this was a very important component. Uh, in my beloved hometown of New Orleans, there's an elevated interstate highway along North Claiborne Avenue that I'm sure you're familiar with. Uh, as a boy, as a very little boy, uh, that median was loaded with oak trees. My grandfather's medical practice uh, and uh, insurance company was headquartered on that street. My father's law practice as, as well as the headquarters of the Urban League and the NAACP and many African American organizations was a half a block off that street. I drive down that street every time I'm home. 
the building where my grandfather's medical practice and insurance company was located has been an abandoned building hmm. since 1975, which is a testament to the damage that this infrastructure project circa 1966, 67, 68, when black people had no vote, no voice, no elected officials. Devastation in splitting, destroying uh, a community and uh, in, an, in an untold way. Only those who can recall or who see photos of what it once was. Mm -hmm. It was as beautiful as St. Charles Avenue. And I know that there's a commitment uh, in this bill to create an opportunity for local governments to okay. address this. Talk about that. Yeah. Why is it important? When you look around the country, what do you see? How many projects like this? I mean, this was, a, a, I think, an innovative component of this infrastructure bill that people are not talking about enough because I think it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's an example of something that's very intentional about equity and repairing and the opportunity to reverse that's right. bad infrastructure decisions that were made in the 20th century. That's just it. The, the purpose of infrastructure, it's supposed to connect. And yet there are so many places in the U.S. where it serves to divide or, or disempower because of how it was built, who was included and who was not in those decisions. And you created such a vivid example around the Claiborne in, uh, in New Orleans. There's an example in just about every community I go to. Sometimes it's a highway, sometimes it's a railroad. The fact that we have the expression wrong side of the tracks in American English tells you something about how pieces of infrastructure can divide communities along economic or racial lines. And this is not just a phenomenon of the South or any one region. The Hill District in Pittsburgh, Rondo neighborhood in St. Paul, Minnesota, the Cross Bronx Expressway. Yeah, Cross Bronx. Is the, and what I think is so important, and you know, I have encountered some pushback for discussing this uh, and been told that I'm out there making everybody feel guilty about our infrastructure. But the point is that we can do something about it especially when federal dollars went into dividing or harming communities, federal dollars can go into making it right and making it better. And by the way, nobody is worse off when we make it better. So we're doing it. The Reconnecting Communities Program and a related program created by the, uh, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act are giving us the tools to work with communities to change this. Buffalo, New York. Uh, one of the first communities that we're able to support. I was up in Buffalo, the Kensington Expressway. Cuts like gash, just right through town. And I sat at a table with community leaders who have been working on this for 30 years, 40 years, hoping there would be a way to change that. Some of them died during the, the, the process of trying to get this done. And we're finally doing it, partnering with the state of New York. Uh, the whole project overall will be about a billion dollar project. And we're putting a substantial amount of funding from this program in to create a kind of a deck over the, in this particular, it depends on the project. In this particular case, you don't have to remove the road, but we're going to deck over it in a way that creates that rarest of things in, in the middle of the city, which is new land, which can be used to connect and stitch and restore. In Michigan, we're taking a different approach with I-375, which when it was built destroyed the neighborhoods of Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. That is going to be surfaced from another kind of depression, kind of a gash, mm -hmm. up to a boulevard on street level. It can still handle yeah, the traffic. It's sunken. Yeah. Exactly. And it's going to make such a difference. In Tampa, there's an interchange that had this effect. We could totally redo it, redo it. Other areas, they're not ready to build yet, but they are working on the planning process. Mm -hmm. uh, matter of fact, not far from here, in Baltimore, uh, there is a road known as the Highway to Nowhere that was built in a way that cut up that neighborhood. They didn't even finish it the, because it got, finally the construction got to a, an area that had enough political capital to stop it. But it remains. And there, the community is still working on the, the engineering and planning dimensions of how to heal that. So we're funding the planning process. And it is so exciting to be able to uh, support these projects. Absolutely. Nobody's worse off when we do it. So many people are better off, and it's just the right thing to do. Uh, and again, creating a lot of good-paying construction jobs along the way. So I'm glad you raised it. Well, and I I'm am excited about and it. And I want to encourage you.
to continue to talk about it and to promote it. And for those that may say, why are you talking about it? I encourage you to just say, a wise person changes, a fool never. And to really address the fact that, you know, part of what we have to do uh, in the 21st century is recognize that for the greatness of the 20th century, there were bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And that continuous improvement should be the watchword, right? We shouldn't we have to own a bad decision. I mean, Claiborne Avenue was so bad, mm. so devastating. It, it literally destroyed this incredible spine. But, and, it, and, and how you repair it is a challenge, or how you change it is a challenge because of the advent of uh, the movement of uh, cargo from the port to the CSX railroad yard. There's some issues that have to be worked out, but uh, my point of view is, uh, and, and you know this from being a mayor, be, get everybody in the room and literally sit down, work through, talk through, look at alternatives, and, and the problem can indeed be solved. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, give Secretary Puttajaj a big, big round of applause. It's been a great uh, discussion. And, and uh, while we'd like to open the floor, we don't have time. Mr. Secretary, I want to give you the last word. Oh, gosh. All right. That doesn't often happen. <laughs> uh, let me end by circling back to where we began, which is I think it's so important, uh, especially knowing the organizations uh, like mm -hmm. the Urban League that have a, a local presence mm -hmm. to understand that while we're continuing the conversation here in Washington, and more importantly, continuing the work about how to enhance access and opportunity uh, to the uh, the economic and, and, and family wealth generation potential of this, this funding. So much of the decision making is closer to home. Mm -hmm. And when communities step forward, when community members engage in these processes, these exquisitely unsexy processes like the, <laughs> the, the proceedings of a metropolitan planning organization <laughs> uh, or uh, a subcommittee of a city council or a planning board, that will have a direct effect yes. on how well we meet our marks and whether we meet the potential of this once in a generation investment serving not only to renew our built infrastructure but to renew uh, our economy in a way that's more equitable than the last. You said it well. Uh, we, we learned some lessons the hard way in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, another wise person once said to me, you, you will always make mistakes. I think this is true for countries as well as people. You'll always make mistakes. It's more to your credit if you make different mistakes in the future than the ones you've yeah, made in the past. Yeah, yeah. Let's learn from the mistakes of the past as we are doing and do something about them and go on to, to new and greater heights. That's what's possible under President Biden's leadership with this funding that we're deploying. But so much will depend on the community level and the private sector to actually get it done. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Secretary Pete Buttigieg. And uh, another time for John Cowan in third way uh, for this great partnership. And to all my Urban League colleagues, thanks for your work in helping the plan today and for coming out. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's program. You've been a great audience, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. All right.
everyone. Well, thanks so much. Um, how about we give another round of applause to the secretary and Mr. Morial? <laughs> I loved um, their conversation. So insightful about the opportunities and the possibilities that are on the table for our country and our businesses. Um, so I'm excited about the conversation we're turning to now. Um, I'm Amani Augustus. I'm the director of the Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity at Third Way. I'm honored to be joined on this panel today by um, these incredible women. To my right is Teresa Lewis, business consultant with the Greater Washington um, Urban League and president of Teresa Lewis Small Business Advisory Services. To her right is Tyra Reedus, acting director at DOT's Office of Small and Disadvantaged Business Utilization. And finally, on the far end is Andrea Jackson, Deputy Compliance Officer at the DC Department of Transportation. So thank you ladies for joining me today. So I want us to have, I want us to have a technical conversation up here. Um, the Secretary, Mr. Morial, did a fantastic job uh, painting this picture for us of the opportunity that's on the table for America's businesses and um, the communities that this bill is gonna serve. But I want to really get underneath that, and I would love for us to examine first the terms we're using. Who, who are we talking about when we're talking about un underrepresented communities and disadvantaged businesses? Um, how that plays a significant role in the federal contracting process. Then we'll turn to how this investment could prepare businesses for follow-on opportunities um, in the contracting market. And then I want to hear how your organizations are working to mobilize communities and resources. And then we'll end on any success stories or ideas about lasting impact um, for, for the investments. So we, right at the end there, we heard Mr. Morial talk about the communities, minority communities in particular, that have been impacted by bad infrastructure decisions and minority businesses that have been overlooked in the past um, as investments from Washington have come down. Um, many of you, all of you, work alongside these businesses, which are often referred to as disadvantaged or underestimated. So Tyra, I wanna start with you. Um, the term disadvantaged is in the name of your office. So how would you describe the communities that we're referring to and some of the barriers that they face? Absolutely. So before I get started, I want to say thank you to the National Urban League and Third Way for inviting me to be part of the panel today. Um, and also to my fellow panelists, it's great to be up here to talk about something that's really important um, to me and the work that I've been doing throughout my career. But, you know, at the department, um, you know, we define disadvantage under the law. So we're talking about small and disadvantaged businesses. Um, as well as the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Program, which is um, special and unique to DOT um, for businesses who are controlled and owned by socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. Um, I like to think of these firms and these businesses as historically excluded businesses because that's exactly what's happened throughout the course of history. Um, and not being um, able to access the contract opportunities um, not having the access to capital, um, and also I think just the difficulty navigating um, not only the direct procurement, working with the federal government directly, but also our federally assisted contracts. Um, as you heard the Secretary talk about, a lot of our, our dollars go out to the local jurisdictions, the states, the MPOs, um, the transit agencies, our airports, our seaports, um, and once those dollars are gone, they decide, right, which projects are funded um, and how those contract opportunities are awarded. Um, so at the department, we're really trying to focus through our wealth, wealth creation efforts um, and equity and procurement on how we can influence those contract opportunities. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we're directly doing that with some of our SBTRCs. Um, but it, it really is an intentional focus, as you heard from the secretary, as well as from our president, um, that we make sure that minority businesses are getting a piece of this bipartisan infrastructure law funding. Um, and that's, that's what we're focused on, and, and we're hoping that all the efforts we're putting into via policy procedures, but also just being out in the community engagement um, and influencing the private sector um, and our, you know, our fund recipients um, that we're going to be able to reduce that wealth gap and move the needle. 
Yeah, thank you. And Ms. Teresa, you were the head of a couple OSTABU offices at HHS and Treasury. Um, anything you would add to the barriers that you uh, recognize small businesses, minority businesses have? I would. I first also want to thank you all for inviting us. And let me just thank the Greater Washington Urban League specifically <coughs> under the National Urban League umbrella for allowing me to represent them today. I retired from HHS Osdebu three years ago, so I've been working with the Urban League ever since, and it's just truly been an honor to see what it looks like, what small business looks like from the federal level to now working at the local level and the impact of of federal legislation, regulations, and programs have at the local at the local level. So, I, and I also spent over ten years at, at the uh, U.S. Small Business Administration. So, my answers will come from those, um, <clears throat> you know, years of experience since I, you know, started the federal government as a child. But anyway, <laughs> the. Federal government does define disadvantage as socially and economically disadvantaged, but what does that look like at the local level? It looks like the lack of information flowing down. So that at the local level, a lot of what the federal agencies are doing doesn't make it to Main Street. And so how we overcome that you know, whether it's through issuing plain speak memos after the law, after the regulation, some sort of, and after the policy, some sort of plain speak memo so that the, the small businesses at the local level know what in the world you're talking about because there's a lot of government ease that government speaks, a lot of government acronyms that nobody knows what they mean. Um, there are acronyms uh, acronyms that mean one thing at one agency and another thing at another. And so being able to just just open that up and explain um, what that is so that the small businesses can take the necessary actions. We know historically that there have been inequities in accessing capital. We know that that has an impact on small businesses' ability to get bonding to perform on these contracts, to buy technology so that they can provide, you know, advanced um, um, services to the federal agencies to buy equipment just to hire the right staff. If you hire the wrong person on a federal contract, you as a small businesses are doomed. You're less likely to be given another opportunity, unlike a large business. And, and your bench is not as deep as a large business. So, and not having enough capital to do that or to even lease facilities. So those are just some of the barriers. You know, they're limited to um, networks. Our small businesses don't always get invited to the party. We know that last year, the federal government, while they may have exceeded their small business goals, they did so with fewer small businesses. So we have fewer, and there are fewer of us that get invited to the party. So how are they gonna get the information and the know-how? So those are just some of the, yeah. the barriers that I see that's preventing our businesses an opportunity to equitably participate. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, Ms. Andrea, I wanna turn to you on the question of certification and the DBE program, mm -hmm. because it is unique to um, federal DOT. Um, oftentimes this certification is a prerequisite to gaining access to investments and partnerships with um, local and federal government um, and DBE standing for disadvantaged business enterprise. Is this an important certification or part of the process uh, for the district department of transportation and have you seen any challenges um, in working with small businesses in navigating the certification process? Sure, yes. Um, I too would like to thank the National Urban League and also Third Way for the invitation, um, but also USDOT, who is our federal partner um, in this um, certification and infrastructure funding bill. Um, greetings on behalf of our mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser, but also to uh, my agency director, uh, Everett Lott, with the District Department of Transportation. So now, 
you're going to hear me say DDOT. That's the acronym <laughs> for District Department of Transportation. Some, some people think it's Detroit <laughs> Department <laughs> of Transportation. So I'll use the term DDOT. Um, but in terms of the certification, it is an absolute critical part um, of this having access to this uh, particular funding as this is federal funding. Um, the Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Certification is a federal certification program. In the district, we also have the um, what we call the SBE, CBE, Central Business Enterprise, which is specific to our locally funded dollars. So we are consistently um, sharing the difference between the two certifications because often when we are getting uh, packages of, um, into our office, you know, they'll come and say, oh, I have a CBE certification, mm -hmm. um, so I should be able to work on a project. So um, first and foremost, explaining the differences between um, the two certifications, um, and then also people getting that understanding that this is federally funded, so they have to be disadvantaged mm -hmm. um, business enterprise under USDOT's regulation. Um, which is 49 CFR Part 26. Um, so the challenges with that is um, really with some of the businesses is documentation. Mm -hmm. um, they, when, when people come to get certified, um, and we're very specific in the application of what documents are needed, um, a lot of small businesses uh, or disadvantaged, I call them diverse business enterprises, by the way, um, do not have their required documents. So we're consistently um, having to assist firms with making sure that they have the re required documents to process the application. Mm -hmm. And that holds up the process. So it can prolong the process for becoming certified. But that's the, the biggest challenge is just mm -hmm. making sure you have the proper documents. Yeah. And Tyra, I see you nodding your head in agreement. And we heard the secretary mention how the DBE process can be a little bit cumbersome for business who uh, maybe going through it for the first time. Is that what you're seeing and hearing from folks um, in your resource centers and things like that? Yes, and I'll, and I'll say that um, this is a really exciting time um, to be at the department because um, we're just undergoing really historic changes and improvements, and one of those is the DBE regulations. Um, they have not been revised or overhauled in years, probably since their inception. Um, but happy to share that last summer in July, um, the department issued the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, another acronym, NPRM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was really based on hearing from small businesses um, and even the industry, you know, um, what their challenges were with getting certification, staying certified. Um, and so a number of really awesome um, proposals came out of that that I want to share. So you heard um, Mr. Morial and the secretary talk about um, the P&W and the gross receipts. So one of the proposed changes is to raise the P&W to 1.6 million. It was previously 1.32 million. Um, and also excluding retirement assets from that calculation. Uh, again, to ease kind of, I think, the struggle that a lot of um, individuals have in staying under that cap um, in order to be certified. Uh, then also the gross receipts. So just recently in March of this year, the gross receipts for FHWA and FTA assisted contracts was increased to 30 million. Um, and so again, that's, we're hoping that that's gonna give a little bit of breathing room um, for some of these firms to get certified, stay certified. You know, one of the other challenges I think we've seen is, you know, we have all of this historic funding going out the door, um, lots of opportunity, large contracts, a lot of our firms are saying, we don't want to take on those contracts because then we're not going to be eligible for the program anymore. Mm -hmm. We're going to lose our certification. So we're hopeful that you know, these changes with the proposed rule will help ease some of those challenges. Um, as well as, you know, I think one of the other things we've heard is it's so difficult to get certified in multiple states. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we're looking at the process for interstate certification one of the proposed changes is to ease some of those administrative requirements. Um, again, want to maintain the integrity of the program, but we understand that we have to also modernize the program um, to make it work um, for the disadvantaged businesses. Yeah, and how does the program and the certification process itself hold, help hold the agency accountable to its contracting goals in terms of working with you know, minority and, and women um, businesses? 
well, all of our, you know, funding recipients as, you know, a requirement of getting those funds from us, they have to um, follow the DBE program, right? And so that means setting DBE goals um, on their projects, on their federally assisted projects. Um, and, you know, that requires the prime contractor to engage and, and award contracts to DBEs. Um, <clears throat> again, it's not a perfect program, um, but I think this is the first step in us improving the program. Um, and it really is, I think, the first step for a lot of disadvantaged businesses to participate on our infrastructure projects. It really also goes back to relationships, um, you know, which is one of the things we're also trying to tackle with our SBTRCs, another acronym for you. Um, <clears throat> DLT is unique in that we have small business regional transportation centers. And so those centers are spread across the country. We have 11 of them. And they're dedicated solely to engaging and supporting DBEs and connecting them to local opportunities with the MPO, with the state DOT, with the transit agency, with the airport. Um, but what we've been doing is we've been going out on a monthly basis for the last year, holding bill symposiums um, geared specifically to talking about the bipartisan infrastructure law, all of the contract opportunities that are out there, and also inviting the private sector and primes to those events to do matchmaking and networking. You know, you need to make sure that the prime knows who you are, that they know the work that you do, because as the secretary mentioned, those things happen sometimes before a project even hits the street. Mm -hmm. But if you have that relationship and you've met that prime and you've been able to make that connection, um, sometimes that improves your, your opportunity and your chance to get those contract awards. So it's just one of the steps that we're taking. Um, definitely not going to solve, I think, all of the challenges, um, but we certainly recognize that we can help in trying to build and, and make those connections. Yeah. And Teresa, um, we just heard Tyra mention the, resort, the regional centers um, that DOT has in communities helping people get connected to opportunities. I know the National Urban League has a vast network of affiliates um, that recognize the importance of having boots on the ground. Um, can you speak to what kind of resources are available through the National Urban League for businesses that are um, thinking about taking the next step? So absolutely. The Greater, the Greater Washington Urban League, but the National Urban League through its entrepreneurship centers, we provide workshops. We provide training on how to do business with the federal government. We introduce them to, to um, banks and to lenders that can um, provide NSBA, their Office of um, uh, Capital Access. We provide them with um, uh, connections to those individuals that can assist them um, with, with um, meeting those requirements. We also provide them with training on social media, um, with how, to, how to, to market your firm using SAM as a, uh, a tool. So we provide that. But I'd like to add um, to Please. the previous conversation yeah. on some suggestions for DOT mm -hmm. and just on ways that, that you could help. And I know that you don't have this authority, but it would be great if you could share this, that the Department of Transportation has certifying agencies mm -hmm. and that when I worked in the SDB program, it, you know, we don't have it now, under the SBA, we had what was called private certifiers. Mm -hmm. So private certifiers were used throughout, they were hired from throughout the community, throughout the country, and they assisted SBA with, with certifying the small businesses for the SDB with the exception of that work that is inherently governmental. That allowed us to increase our numbers, that allowed us to reach out into the community and I think an organization like the Urban League and its entrepreneurship centers could serve as um, additional certifying agencies so that you can reach more of the DBEs that are in our communities. So I definitely think that that's something for you all to consider. I also think Mr. Morial alluded to it, but having some sort of state scorecard because we know that the states aren't reaching their goals and so what it sometimes shining the light, kind of like SBA has scorecards for the 24 CFO agencies, 
So having a scorecard to shine the light on the states that are not performing might actually get their attention, but there's got to be some federal intervention, even, <coughs> even when it comes to training the staff. Some states do it one way, some states do it another. So having that consistency that everyone is held accountable for, I think that that will be helpful as well. And then I looked at your website for your SBRTC, mm -hmm. and there are some that are really good. There are others where their websites are not. So that's confusing for some of the DBEs. And looking at the services that they provide, they don't all provide training on how to complete the certification, the DBE application. So having, even, even if, if DOT would give grants to organizations similar like the Community Navigator, mm -hmm. to organizations like the Urban League who can actually train the individuals in the local areas, you can reach more, because that's really the intent, right? To extend into the communities, you need organizations like the Urban League that can help you do that. So uh, That's excellent, thank, yes, you. thank you. And I wanna turn to you, Andrea, um, to tell us from the local perspective how you are communicating these opportunities to businesses um, and you know the resources that are available. Sure, so um, at DDOT, <laughs> um, we're doing a number of things. We, I am very fortunate to have a chief um, my chief is Nana Bailey Thomas and also an agency director who understands the, the impact of having a disadvantaged business as a part of our process. Um, we have a whole equity um, um, process in terms of our goal setting. We have seven goals, equity is one of them, but that's also business inclusion. Um, I'm also fortunate to have, prior to coming to DDOT, I was a disadvantaged business owner. I was a small business, veteran-owned business, and a minority business in the state of Maryland. Mm. Um, so I did that for 10 years. So I'm on both sides of the coin. Mm -hmm. um, so I get it um, when you know we have these barriers and challenges. One of the things that DDOT we were doing was we created um, what we call capacity building workshops. Mm -hmm. And I heard Secretary Budacek mention the word intentional. Mm -hmm. um, we want to be intentional in terms of what information that we are providing to DBE firms. Now, I'm personally having been on the other side of the coin. I don't like taking workshops for the simple fact of taking a workshop right. and somebody checking off a box. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get some developed workshops that are being taught by our Office of Contracts and Procurement. Um, they're telling you how to grow from a subcontractor to a prime contractor. They're giving you requirements to put together your bid packages um, because a lot of small firms and DBE firms don't have this information. That's right. Um, they're used to putting it, a package together as a subcontractor, but they've never done it as a prime. So they don't know about the insurances and risk management and mm -hmm. bonding and, and different things that they have to do. So our Office of Contracting and Procurement have been working with us to just conduct those trainings. Of course, we have the bonding class. Um, we also have, um, we develop a contractor's information portal on our website. You can go to d.dc.gov. Um, and this contractor's information portal has everything you need to know. So there's a forecast of opportunities. There's the Office of Contracting and Procurement. There's um, what contracts have been awarded. You know, there's a whole transparency portal. So we try to streamline um, all of the places where you would go to find information and, and, and have it on one web page um, mm -hmm. so that you could just click links and go. Mm -hmm. um, my office also, we're, we're having virtual office hours. So on June 7th, we have virtual office hours for the entire day. My staff do nothing but have appointments and you know the, the DBE firms get to call in and we are intentionally making sure that we respond to any issues and challenges they have. Mm -hmm. um, Earlier, Ms. Reed has talked about building relationships mm -hmm. with your prime contractors. We host two events per year um, outside of our capacity building workshops, which is monthly. We have a different one monthly. But um, in November, we host the DBE networking, um, DBE summit and networking event. And it's usually at Gallaudet. It's our big annual event where we have all of our procurement opportunities in one place. So you get to talk to every decision maker at DDOT is there. 
Um, we have our um, um, Infrastructure Planning and Management Administration, IPMA, that's another acronym, where our Operations Division, our Office of Contracting and Procurement, OCP. Um, so they're there and they're saying, here's a forecast of opportunities through the next four years. Mm -hmm. And they break that's it good. down by dollar value. So if you're a small DBE or a large prime contractor, you can see then in 2024, this project is for $500,000 is projected to, you know, be on a plate. That means be on the lookout for That's it. Good. Um, so it, we have construction management and professional services opportunities as well. So we're trying to make sure that we are um, intentionally providing DBE firms with information. We also have um, a DBE networking event. And it'll be on June the 29th this year at um, HQO, which is DC Water Headquarters. Um, this is our Meet the Primes Day. So we're gonna have all of our prime contractors and DBE firms, and that's all they're gonna be doing. There's no speeches and all of this great stuff. That's it's good. just networking. Now, in addition to them, all of our project teams will be there as well. Um, so they get to talk one-on-one -on -one with the DBE firm, get to know them, get to build that relationship, understand what they can do. Um, so these are some of the things that we're doing to make sure that we give DBE firms opportunities and access. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I love how that also helps um, these primes who operate, do projects with government, but also in the private sector, mm -hmm. holding them accountable and seeing and recognizing the opportunity that there is to work with these disadvantaged or um, diverse businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to turn to any particular successes or um, stories that you can share with us about where you've seen government and business and advocates kind of come together to deliver a positive result for the community. And Andrea, maybe I'll start with you since you're more local. I'm more vocal? Local. 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 <laughs> <laughs> you can be vocal too. <laughs> um, well, one of the things that we've done recently, which is helping the agency, so this is helping us as an agency, is our small businesses um, and small business organizations like the National Association of Minority Contractors, you know, different small businesses, our director have been hosting roundtables. And so the businesses are giving us feedback on what we can do to improve or giving us ideas on what we need to implement, even in terms of our procurement, how it would help them to have more access to contracting opportunities. Um, that has been very successful. The agency director has implemented some of the ideas, um, but also internally for us, getting that feedback, it's helped us to look at our policies and our processes that create these barriers. And so we're now revising our processes and policies, much like USDOT is doing, to make sure that we eliminate the barriers um, for DBE firms to do business with DDOT. Mm -hmm. So I think that's been successful. And it's just not the round table. He's been on listening tours, like just, just meeting with different groups. Um, um, and so it's helpful to me because that comes down. And so on the implementation end, um, it helps the DBE firms that they can see that we're actually doing the work, you know, um, taking their feedback and suggestions and being intentional about making sure that we are inclusive in our projects. Right. Anybody else on the panel? I just wanted to add that at the Urban League, several of our affiliates are SBA community navigators. Mm, yeah. And so we are available to assist all small businesses, not to mention that we do have the 13 um, uh, entrepreneurship centers and at the Great Washington Urban League we have personal relationships with the uh, USSBA headquarters which we meet with on a regular and, um, and there are other agencies that we have connected our small businesses with so for example we had several um, small businesses that were interested in doing international trade and we are that's an area where we are growing our small businesses and so we have been working with the U.S. Department of Commerce and their International Trade Administration as well. So we've had, had great success with that, mm -hmm. with, with expanding a lot of our 
um, businesses weren't aware that there were resources available, so we've been able to deliver to them that knowledge and making the connection for them that they would not have had were it not for the Urban League. So. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, we heard the secretary mention, and, and I'll turn to my final question here before I give you all the last word. Um, we heard him mention that the potential and the possibility behind this massive um, investment of funds is not just to revive our infrastructure around the country, but to also open an opportunity to build generational wealth um, for people and communities. And so I was wondering if you all could leave us with one or two thoughts on what you think or what you hope uh, the lasting impact of this investment that's starting to flow through communities um, would be um, if and when we deliver uh, that investment to minority businesses? Absolutely. So, um, you know, it's, it's a constant um, permeation in the department these days. Um, the, the focus is wealth creation. Um, all of the initiatives that we're going to be rolling out in the next year and a half um, are geared toward how can we close the, the racial wealth gap um, through this funding and how can we um, make sure, again, that you know, our minority businesses um, leave or are better after this funding um, is all awarded. Um, and so to that, um, I think one of the, the really exciting initiatives that we're working on um, is our Access to Capital Initiative. Um, this is a, a program um, that I don't think has ever been presented to minority businesses in a real way, um, but we're working to connect private investors with DBEs who are ready for that capital infusion mm -hmm. to help them grow their business and build capacity. Um, and at the same time, we're forward thinking, looking at emerging markets and technology and transportation, right? How can we start to build the pipeline now of entrepreneurs, particularly minority-owned businesses, um, to support EV charging, you know, to support um, you know, carbonization, to support climate, all of those things, right, that are gonna be at the forefront of the work of the department. How can we make sure that we have a, a pipeline of disadvantaged businesses um, that will be able to participate and support that work moving forward? Um, but we're really excited about, you know, just the opportunity, I think, to bring something new um, to this community. Um, in terms of the private equity. And, and, and it's more than just providing the information. So we, uh, we have the relationships through Sam Boyd, who's sitting right there. Um, he is working with these private investors and he's bringing them to the firms and making those connections. And the way we're gonna track our progress is we have an online tool that we're developing as well so that the firms and the investors can you know, find each other in that place and then we're tracking what happens, what deals are made, right? What results from these connections? Um, and that's where we're really hoping to see the, the needle move um, quite a bit in wealth creation. Yeah. Anyone else on what you're hoping to see the lasting impact be for communities and businesses through this funding? So, go ahead. No, go ahead. So what I'd like to see is an intentional door open for our um, DBEs in our community, and that looks like hosting ind industry days where you identify NAICS codes. I actually looked at some of the NAICS codes um, that would fall under the infrastructure bill. I looked at, for example, road construction, commercial construction, urban planning, and in, in the 8A program, there are over a thousand in road construction, almost two thousand in commercial construction and urban planning. There's 150. I would love to see DOT host industry days where they reach out to those firms specifically and invite them so that they know that they are wanted and consider their capabilities. So I'd really like to see, you know, intentional outreach to those organizations, to those um, firms. I would love to see the DOT use organizations like the Urban League to assist them with reaching those small businesses at the local community because I think that is the only way that you're going to increase DBE participation by our firms is by using the local organizations that can reach them. And I'd love to see more accountability 
to the states and to the primes over those federal dollars because we know that unfortunately there are not enough contracting officers that review the subcontracting reports and not at the federal level and I know not at the state level and so what are we doing because if we are given money to the primes and they are not awarding to our DBEs who's holding them accountable so there's got to be more transparency around that so I would love to see to see that happen and again I think just encouraging outreach, using organizations like the Urban League to provide policy review before it even hits the street um, to, to consider the impact on our small businesses, as well as using us as an organization to provide data. So those are just you know, some Absolutely. of the things that I would like to see come out uh, and that the Urban League as an organization would like to see come out of this infrastructure bill. And Andrea, I'll give you the last word on what you'd like to see have lasting impact. Sure. So I would like to see um, subcontractors move into the prime roles. Um, however, it's going to require um, more supportive services um, mm -hmm. in order for them to do that. And um, a lot of times, you know, when they want to move up again, just making sure that they have the proper paperwork or understanding um, regulations and policies is a challenge um, but for us you know we do get discretionary funding for supportive services um, and not even just from the federal but those local resources being pulled into supportive services we have a, um, a local um, department of small local and disadvantaged business here in the district and we partner with them a lot but again it's that supportive services piece that I would like to see um, the states, you know, make sure that we have the proper funding to support um, DBE firms, make sure that we have the proper funding to support um, DBE firms that want to go into prime mm -hmm. contracting opportunities. Yeah. That's excellent. Well, can I have a round of applause for our panel? Thank you all so much for being here today. And then let's give another hand to the Secretary, Mr. Morial, for joining us. Well, if you would like to learn more about the Alliance for Entrepreneurial Equity and follow our work to increase opportunities for women and people of color to start and also grow successful businesses, please follow along with us at AEX.